This is The Reason Interview with Nick Gillespie. My guest today is Joe Lonsdale, a founder of the data analytics firm Palantir, of OpenGov, which provides cloud software services for governments, and the University of Austin, which seeks to reform higher education. He's the managing partner of 8VC, a tech and life sciences venture capital fund, and is chairman of the board of the Cicero Institute, a nonprofit working to restore liberty, accountability, and innovation in American governance. A California native who relocated his family and business to Texas, we talk about why he left the Golden State, how to curb government overreach while providing essential services, his goals for his podcast, American Optimist, and his 2020 article, Libertarianism is Dysfunctional, but Liberty is Great. Here is The Reason Interview with Joe Lonsdale. Joe Lonsdale, thanks for talking to Reed. Thanks for having me, Nick. Um, you know, let's, let me start with something very basic. Uh, your VC firm is called 8VC. Explain what that refers to. The 8 and mean. Yeah. Oh, well, you know, originally we had a firm called Formation 8 with some Korean partners, and they took Formation, and I took 8. Eight's a lucky number. In, in, in Asia, it's a lucky number. Actually, in Judaism, it kind of represents beyond the seven days, it represents beyond. So you can see infinity is kind of tied to eight. And it's a lucky number. You know, you have to have lucky numbers. D and does it tie into the history of Silicon Valley? It does as well. You're right. So one of my favorite stories there is, you know, we talk about waves of innovation in Silicon Valley. And the second big wave of innovation was the semiconductor wave. That's why it's called Silicon Valley, because the Silicon wafers. And, you know, the, the guy who, you know, one of the three Nobel Prize winners of, uh, who invented the transistor, Shockley, he... Uh, brought eight of the most impressive people he could find to Silicon Valley and turned out he was a t great scientist but terrible boss and he kept giving them lie detector tests and finally they left and they said this is enough of this we're doing our own and they got someone else to back them called Fairchild so they built Fairchild Semi mm -hmm. and those eight people at Fairchild Semi it was more of Moore's Law it was Eugene Kleiner of Kleiner Perkins it was the guys who built a lot of Silicon right. Valley so it really pays homage to the history of the tech sector. And then Shockley just to cap that story ended his career by promoting scientific racism. So he, it's not he, ideal, I suppose, yeah. either. So yes, yeah, so at least fortunately, we're, we're on the side of the eight people who didn't work with That's him anymore. Right. Yeah. Um, you, I, I guess another question. Uh, when did you move to Texas in 2020? 2020. 2020. Good time to move. Good time to buy, I suppose. But you left California. You're, you're raised in California. You went to school in California. You've thrived in California. Mm -hmm. You founded, co-founded Palantir in California. Mm -hmm. um, why did you move to Texas? And what does that say about governance strategies? You know, there's a lot of things California yeah. has going for it, and, and we still have to go there sometimes for things we do, but California got to be really broken. I wrote a piece in the Wall Street Journal mm -hmm. at the time. You know, I had about a thousand people working for six companies in Austin because you couldn't really scale companies in San Francisco anymore. It became really expensive. Uh, basically, you know, you'd hire someone in there you'd pay them $300,000 and their spouse would, would really resent it because their, their standard of living for, for that much money was still not very high mm -hmm. in Silicon Valley. Uh, you know, our staff would have to drive over an hour to come back and forth, even if they were paid well. So, so really, really not a good place for middle class living standards. Government or was, even upper class. I mean, if you're 300,000, yeah, exactly. you're in the top two or five percent, probably not a good place for upper middle class living yeah, standards yeah. either. Yeah. I should say exactly. It's like depending how you look at it. But it's basically a lot of billionaires and a lot of people yeah. who are just getting along. And you know, it's it's, it's there's, there's all sorts of issues in California. The home has been broken into recently, or with a crime. There's it's hard to build things. If you get sued, you're probably guilty until proven innocent. So mm -hmm. the really bad court system and just all these reasons why we didn't really want to raise our family there culturally mm -hmm. either. It's, you know, I'm pretty moderate as a, as you know, socially, I, you know, it's, but you know, there's just really crazy things going on there and you'd much rather raise your kids somewhere sane. And to me, you know, a lot of my friends actually left America. They got really negative. It's really sad. Some of them went, you know, became made a lot of money, went to Switzerland or Singapore or elsewhere. Mm -hmm. And I really believe in America. I believe in our right. constitutional republic. I believe in the values that created this country. And so for me, choosing to go to Texas is like, let's stay here. Let's fight mm -hmm. for our country. But let's do it from somewhere sane. Um, why, um, what was most attractive about Texas? I mean, because people, you know, the, the four most populous states in the country are California, New York, Texas, Florida. Mm -hmm. um, and California and New York are losing people to Texas and Florida. Um, what was it about Texas that you liked um, more than Florida? Yeah, you know, I, I'm, we do love Florida. We love Governor DeSantis and the, the rule of law there and the great policy they do. Mm -hmm. Texas, do you like the white boots that he wears? I'm not as partial to the white okay, boots. Or, I, or, I, or, yeah, okay. that's, that's, that's yeah. tougher for me, but, but we, we have just passed a lot of great right. legislation with him. Yeah. And, and, and listen, I think if I was just a hedge fund investor, mm -hmm. uh, Palm Beach would be a great place to live. I have a lot of mentors there. I think Miami's 
you know, good place for that. You know, culturally, Texas is a better place to build things. There's a lot more, there's a history of building technology companies here in Austin, mm -hmm. Texas. There's a, a lot more engineers, a lot more, there's a, one of the great engineering schools that's here, a lot of great companies. If you look at who's moved here to Austin, Texas, I have a lot of my fellow entrepreneurial, entrepreneurial friends. So mm -hmm. you know, Elon Musk is spending time in Texas, right. not in Florida, for the same reasons as me, as me I think. Yeah. Um, in Texas, you, you said it's easy to build here. Can you talk about that a little bit more? Because that is something Texas is known for. I mean, it's got a lot of wide open space. Um, on the city level, many cities don't have any kind of zoning or, or very limited zoning and planning uh, ordinances and things like that. What is it about Texas? Yeah, there's, there's, there's less stupid rules. There's less bureaucrats. You know, mm -hmm. even this house, when we were trying to do some work in the back, I think we we called the city and they said, oh, you're in the extrajudicial territory, call the county. And we called the county and he said, mm -hmm. are you all dumping sewage? And we said, no, sir, we're trying to yeah. like build this extension. And he said, oh, then why are you all calling me for it? Just do what you'd mm -hmm. like. And I'm like, this is amazing. This place it just lets you do what you want. And you know, it, it also say the governor and the people here, when you call them up with a problem as a business, they say, how can I help you? How can I help you get this done? How can I help you build? Mm -hmm. In California, uh, I think famously when Elon Musk complained to them online, they said F you, right? right. And so, so it's a very different culture of, of kind of working with you to help enable you as a, as a builder uh, and stay out of your way, frankly, versus, versus getting in your way. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about some of, the, uh, some of your uh, billionaire friends who left the country rather than staying here. And it's, you know, everybody has a right of exit and that's a wise strategy. They have right to do I, it. All of us so at some point are grandparents or great-grandparents exited somewhere to come here, right? Um, but, you know, Ed, are, are they doomers in a way? I mean, you, you are, uh, uh, you know, part of the um, uh, effective accelerationist movement. Uh, you are very much a white-pilled kind of ra uh, optimist about the future. Um, what's, what's wrong with going to Singapore? Listen, yeah, I'm a realist. I, I think they're right that there's a lot we have to fix about America. Yeah. Uh, my father raised me to be courageous, and, and what your, your job as a leader is you confront things that are broken, and, and that, that's what you're supposed to do. That's what's part of to me, it's part of my masculine mm -hmm. urge. I have to fix things. I have to stand up for what's right. And so to me, it's just not who I am to run away. And you know, I, I could see the argument in different contexts in history where it did make sense to run away. Like I had Jewish relatives and so, some of whom, you know, fortunately left Poland on right. time. That was, that was correct. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I don't think there are places to run away to right now that could get away from the types of battles that we need to fight in the world, that we need to win in the world. So there, there's not, it's not obvious to me that liberty and freedom and, and markets and innovation for, for healthcare, for all these other areas, mm -hmm win out if America goes the wrong way. So, so I, th I, think, I think we have to have that fight here because if we lose, we'll probably lose everywhere else. Mm. Um, so are you just kind of temperamentally, uh, I don't even want to say an optimist, but looking towards the future and wanting to build the future as opposed to wanting to kind of preserve or conserve the present or the past? It, uh, or you know, what goes into that thinking for you to be you know, part of saying, okay, we need to be doing more stuff. We need to be trying more stuff. We need to be opening things up more. You know, I guess I like to think I'm an entrepreneur who sees the world for how it is. I see what's possible. I see the gaps. I see where we are now and where we could be. And I, and I like to see, you know, I, I like to think that we can see what will happen if we don't do something and it will happen if we do something. Mm. And, you know, I've built a lot of companies because I realized this thing's broken, but here's what's possible. Mm. And I see a lot of those gaps around policy and government as well. And I, I mean, I'm optimistic that with the right builders, we could do it. I'm not optimistic yeah. these things will just happen. Right. But I'm optimistic that if a bunch of us get together and we fight for it, that we, that we can't win. Um, let's talk first about some of the businesses you built, and then we'll talk about some of the policy stuff that you're doing through Cicero <clears throat> and whatnot. And I guess before we go on to that, like we're not going to read tomorrow that you have a secret bunker in New Zealand or anything like that. Uh, no, actually, I don't have. You know, or I, even I, a, I, a known bunker. In, I, I I don't have. Yeah. I, I I listen. I respect that people have bunkers all around the world. I don't think there's anything yeah. wrong with doing that. Yeah. Um. You know, I I have I have places around the United States, mm -hmm. but but uh, but no, I'm I'm making my stand here. I'm an American. Yeah. Um, so let's uh, talk about AI um, and how that plays out, because this is this seems to be the new bugaboo right now that everybody is freaking out about AI. Uh, there are I don't know. I, it feels to me like it's starting to shift where people as they become a little bit more comfortable with AI or at least as it's kind of moving through the system now, they're like, oh, this is actually going to be helpful as opposed to this is going to put me out of a job or make me a slave to a machine. What is the crux about you know, kind of concerns over AI right now? And why are you on the positive side of things rather than the kind of 
we got to slow down and regulate everything to death. Yeah, you know, there, there's really, there's really a, there's really a couple different buckets I put the concerns mm -hmm. into. I think one of the more extreme concerns, which you know, I think there's expressed well by people like I mean, Tim Urban and mm -hmm. people like Elon Musk, kind of show this exponential takeoff of AI. And you know, there's a lot of techies who it's kind of interesting. Throughout American history, we've had a lot of times where there's these messianic complexes where people are convinced that the Messiah is going to come and the world's going to yep. end, and it just it seems to occur every couple of generations. And this is a kind of a secular version of a messianic. Mm -hmm complex that they're arguing for yeah. and the, the the idea being but the you don't know if it's jesus or the antichrist right i think you could argue either one actually yeah. very interestingly or, or, or analogs of either yeah. one in some interesting ways and so so people are saying yes this thing takes off it starts to improve itself and and listen it's very impressive how well this is working mm -hmm. and so so how are we going to have brought to bear a new form of, of god effectively that's mm -hmm. a thousand times you know smarter than people and just basically runs the world in in, in 10 20 30 years uh, I think it's pretty unlikely, but I think mm -hmm. there are smart people who believe that's the case, yeah. and, and, and that, that's a worthy conversation. But you're debate. a smart person, and you don't—you're not betting on that. You're betting on something else. You know, if it actually turns out that it is possible to create that with this technology, I don't think we're going to stop it long term mm -hmm. anyway. Yeah. And I don't know if there's much I could do about it. So I, I, uh, you know, we, we have we, again, we have that debate. I think it seems pretty unlikely to me, mm -hmm. and I think it seems like it'll take a lot longer than people think. What are the things that AI will do for people that? they're not kind of understanding. Yeah, What's so, the so, value so there's a two buckets. There's like the messianic bucket, yeah. and that's like one argument. And I think it's a very separate argument we can discuss or not, which is which is this very crazy end of, end of time sort of debate. Right. And then there's like everything else argument where they're like afraid of disinformation, they're afraid of destroying mm -hmm. jobs, they're afraid of, mm -hmm. like, and we shouldn't conflate the two arguments, right? They're two right. separate arguments. Like if you're gonna have a God who destroys jobs, that's like a stupid thing to debate. Like yeah. it's, gonna, it's gonna be different anyway. So, right. but, but so let's go over this bucket over here, like what's actually going to happen. And as far as I could tell, this is going to be like one of the best things ever for humanity mm -hmm. if, if, to the point where it's like, I mean, productivity, as you know, is like the underlying factor for how well our civilization mm -hmm. is doing, how well the economy is doing. And I think it, it, productivity can go way up over the next right. decade. I think it can basically free us from drudgery. It can make things really inexpensive for poor people and for mm -hmm. everyone else. Can you give like a specific example of how you think, it, you know, granted all predictions are wrong, but you know, that AI will make life easier or better for people. Yeah, so let, let's start with what it's already doing, right? Yeah. So there's something that came out in the last month from companies like Klarna, which is a big payments company, and people have to call and deal with them. And I think they have 70% of the calls being handled by the AI now. Mm -hmm. And the people are happier with those with those calls mm -hmm. and then can call back less to bother them afterwards and saving them a lot of money on those. And there's there's lots of versions of this. Uh, Michael Dell, who's, who's yep. also a major presence here in Austin, Texas, mm -hmm. I think he was saying the other day uh, when he was here that he thinks has going to have 20% higher productivity for his company of 120,000 mm -hmm. people. And so basically, and there's all sorts of applications of that. You know, Michael's a very serious guy. He doesn't just make wild right. claims. It's like, it's like he actually sees how he thinks in the next two years, he's going to have this for like certain salespeople being helped, mm -hmm. certain marketing documents, certain customer support processes. And so, so you have, and then I'll give you one other one, healthcare billing. Sounds mm -hmm. like a boring area. Why are we talking about it? Over $200 billion a year spent on healthcare billing in the right. U.S. as people on, you know, office parks, you know, maybe going mm -hmm. back and forth with insurance companies. And there's like tens of thousands of rules, each for thousands of companies. It's a mess. Millions yeah. of people trying to do this. And, and so it turns out we already, we have companies that are, that are making that a few times more productive, which is going to pull out another $100 billion of waste out of the economy. Mm -hmm. So you have, you have this productivity hitting in all these areas. It seems very likely over the next few years. Um, let's talk about Palantir. You were, you're one of the co-founders uh, in what, it was 2003, is that right? Is I was 20, 20, 21 years old and we started it yeah. back then. How I, did you start at that at that I age? Still I mean, you were, you were at Stanford. I had just finished at Stanford. I was helping Peter. Peter had, Peter Thiel. Peter Thiel was an investor with Facebook at the yeah. time and, and we had a hedge fund we were running together. Mm -hmm. I was working for him at it and he backed my roommate and I to start this. And I, mm -hmm. my, I hired most of the first couple hundred people and you know that the, the idea was is that at PayPal, where we, where Peter had started and mm -hmm. sold PayPal before, and I was an intern at PayPal, and the Chinese and Russian mafia were stealing all of our money. You know, you, you find PayPal as Peter Thiel and Elon Musk merged right. two companies to become that, yeah. and so we had to figure out how to stop the bad guys. And it turned out that you know all the talent that had been brought together in Silicon Valley around that time, around that first tech bubble in 2000, were able to figure out things like how to investigate bad guys that were way ahead yeah. of what the government was doing. This was a this was a shocking realization that like all these young engineers were actually way ahead because we always kind of had been brought up 
even in, this, in the computer science world, you hear stories about the NSA in the mm -hmm. 1970s doing things that even no one even understood until 15 right. years later. They're, they're so far well, ahead of us. Until the congressional hearings, right? <laughs> that revealed well, them. But, well, the congressional hearings yeah. revealed them, but, but, but honestly, they would do things and they would, people would be able to yeah. look at it and then the academics couldn't explain it. And then academics right. learned why with much more advanced theories, much further on. Oh, wow, right. this is why. So, so they were way ahead of us in the government from the mid 20th yep. century. But that was no longer the case in 2000. Mm -hmm. And so we started helping the FBI and Secret Service arrest the bad guys at PayPal. And my roommate and I at the time got really interested in this. Wow, there's all this investigative stuff we're doing. Mm -hmm. And 9-11 happened and the government was spending billions of dollars on stupid, frankly, backwards things that were not nearly right. as advanced. We said, wow, this is really dangerous. We have bad guys attacking our country. Mm -hmm. We have people violating civil liberties, not using the data right. Let's build something that uh, could take the best and brightest in this mm -hmm. area and extend it to help all of our allies stop the bad guys. And I mean, what's what's the genius? What was the genius inside of Palantir? Was it kind of knitting together databases that were uh, and information that was kind of siloed from one another? If you want to, or? if you want to go to the highest level, uh, the genius was first of all, we were ranked number one in Silicon Valley for the talents. So there's a lot mm -hmm. of very hard engineering problems all combined. You had to do to mm -hmm. solve these things. So you just, just you didn't really have effective technology cultures yeah. being applied to DC. But at the very, but the, but the high level for the product, you can think of it as. You know, David Hume was a big inspiration for us of how reason works, how the mind works. Like, what are the ways in which the human mind can can grapple with data that's too big to be kept inside one human mind? So you mm -hmm. had you had tens of billions of dollars being spent gathering all sorts of types of data in thousands of databases. How does a human analyst mm -hmm. look at this and, and connect the dots? And so you had to basically figure out how you'd start with you know one set of objects and properties and, and link them in various ways to other things and say, show me everything connected to this by this type of data. Show me everyone mm -hmm. this person's flown with. Show me everything that's connected to this where they have. You know, where they have like similar names, basically, they might be the same person. Show me everything where they've, they've show me everyone they've paid, and then show everyone they've paid, and, and watch the cash flows and look at it, and just just helping people get their minds into massive data, and then monitor it in a way that's intuitive to them, so that when some random signal intelligence six months later showed a payment between two suspicious guys, mm -hmm. all of a sudden they can connect the dots, and we could find where yeah. the bad guys are. So it's just it's just really it's really hard to say who's allowed to see what data, right. how do you see it, yeah, how do you bring it together? Can we talk about that a little bit? Because this, you know, from a from a libertarian perspective, it's like, okay, this the engineering and technological feats are fantastic. The idea of following data flows where you can find bad behavior and, and target that rather than, you know, kind of doing large sweeping nets of all sorts of people, that's great. And, you know, ob obviously the successes that you got, uh, Palantir talks about the most is finding the uh, un unveiling China's ghost net program as well as probably taking or helping to locate Osama bin Laden. Is that pa 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 Palantir yeah. was behind thousands of terrorists yeah. being 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 okay. targeted and eliminated. So that that's all good. And then what are the concerns or how do you work with a government you know that is known for violating civil liberties on a fairly regular basis? Um, you know, how do, how do you build a system so that you're not merely the handmaiden to a kind of surveillance state? Yeah, so, so the whole core of Palantir was basically a civil liberties engine at the, from the start. Mm -hmm. It's what data are you allowed to see in what context? Mm -hmm. And how do we bring that together and, let, and show you only where you're allowed to see it and let, and let you get your job done, right? Mm -hmm. so, this, so the problem is, is, is I think a lot of these guys, maybe they think they're Jack Bauer in the show 24. I don't know if that's a dated reference now, but these, these, I these, think it might be. Yeah, it's like, so someone, someone, yeah. Someone, someone who's in charge of like catching the bad guys and so they're gonna break the rules and they're right. gonna break the rules to find the bad guys. And like, we don't want you to be able to break the rules if you're not supposed to break them, but we want you to get the bad guys anyway. That's right. the whole point of this. And so it's actually a really hard data problem. Like what are you legally allowed to see and, 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 and what's the mm. policy? And we don't set the policy, but, but we, we make it so it's very transparent so, and, and so if Palantir is installed at a certain part of the FBI or the CIA mm -hmm. or anywhere else, the people running that can go back and look, here's the rules, here's, here's mm -hmm. what they were done, here's where, here's where the rules were changed, here's who changed them. Mm -hmm. and, and you have basically full audit logs, full audit trails, mm -hmm. and, and you're doing things within the system. I mean, you do need to, by the way, make it so you can change rules because there is policy change that happens. Mm -hmm. But it needs to be transparent, it needs to be clear who did what, so someone can't just get in and do something inappropriate. Uh, here's a, a kind of strange question. Would you, you know, what what is your reaction to people like uh, Julian Assange and WikiLeaks or Edward Snowden? Um, I guess first, like revealing what they revealed, but then also if the design, if the systems were designed better, um, this William Binney, who was a longtime NSA uh, person who ended up uh, blowing the whistle on a couple of things, said, you know, what was amazing about Snowden pulling data out was like he never should have been able to do that. Oh yeah, that was incompetent. So I mean, so that partly that reveals an incompetence in government and, and kind of large scale things. Yes. But how do you feel about people like that? Is are they? Are they good? They're testing the system in a way, right? 
there's good and bad there. So, mm -hmm. so as, 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 a, as a libertarian, as someone who thinks the government wastes tons of money on tons mm -hmm. of incompetent things, uh, you want whistleblowers to call out the government. You want to call out waste. You want to call out bad actors. Um, at the same time, uh, we do have, and this is what really gets me a lot of times, I think Palantir, along with some really talented people, helps stop a lot of major attacks, mm -hmm. right? A lot of major Can attacks. Can you name one? I, and I realize it's hard to say, okay, well, we stopped this. Attack, I mean, so. we literally helped eliminate thousands of terrorists that were planning attacks on us mm -hmm. that we wouldn't have otherwise many times okay. found or stopped, including the famous ones as you, as yeah. you alluded to that. I think we don't talk about in public because we don't want crazy people coming for us. But right. but but in, but in general, uh, like you know, we we were close to people who helped uh, uncover tons of these different rings of people who were clearly planning uh, you know mm -hmm. violent attacks in America. In some cases, stopped them only with very little time to spare. And it's it's very frustrating to me that because you had so much competence in stopping these things, people now assume you don't need anything at all in the intelligence mm -hmm. community. So so I agree, there's abusive elements of the mm -hmm. intelligence community. I agree that a lot of times when something's confidential, they're using that to get away mm -hmm. with nonsense. But I disagree with the idea that there's not like bad guys in the world right. we have to fight. And so, sure. so for, for, for me, it's like, let's make the government competent, but let's make the system so it watches the watchers. Right. Uh, well, one of the other ways that Palantir has been helping to maybe not watch the watchers, but kind of keep government accountable. Um, you guys have helped to track bad payments coming out of the stimulus programs, right? That coming. Oh out yeah, TARP was a mess. Yeah. yeah, talk a little bit about how you know, kind of data mining or you know, what you're doing with Palantir show showcases where bad payments go. Yeah, I mean, I believe, I think actually to Joe Biden's credit at the time as vice mm -hmm. president, I think he was involved yeah. in helping helping bring Palantir in a long time ago and making sure that we were tracking where all this money was going because there was, there is just generally a lot of fraud around mm -hmm. these issues. And so so the more you track any kind of government spending well, the more you understand it with a competent level, the more you're going to find all sorts of bad actors. Unfortunately, this was not always applied to my knowledge to COVID spending. It wasn't always mm -hmm. applied as much as I would have liked to. I mean, I, How does that work though? I mean, it, so like you have systems set up where you can kind of figure out if it's likely that a payment was made in error or went to the wrong person or kind of how does that system work? Yeah, it's like, it's like I mean, if you go back to like even the very simple, not simple, but the complicated fraud problem at PayPal, mm -hmm. it's like you're basically, you're basically mining through the information and you're, and you're connecting different analyses and you're finding you're finding, first of all, cases that are of known fraud, which are not that hard to find, and then you're mm -hmm. modeling those to search for things that are similar. And, mm -hmm. and, you're, and you're piecing through it and you're flagging a bunch of suspicious things. And then you let someone, you know, the human, a person does not have time to go through millions of these things. Right. But if you flag things that are very suspicious to them and then show all the data in an intuitive way to them, they say, wait a second, this is obviously something that's wrong, mm -hmm. right? And it's like, I remember back at PayPal, there'd be like payments, there'd be a bunch of emails that were like clearly all set up by the same person, like Baseball 2000 at Yahoo, mm -hmm. Football 2000 at Yahoo, yeah. whatever it was. And like, all the money's going to those accounts and going out to the banks yeah. right away. You know, it's, it's like clearly like it's coordinated network or something that shouldn't yeah. have been doing it. That the computer didn't know it for sure, but once you show it to a person, it becomes obvious. So it's, you work together on these things. Do you have a sense of, you know, can you ballpark what percentage of uh, stimulus uh, payments were either wrong or, you know, they shouldn't have been made? I, I, I don't have that information yeah. myself. I, I know that, I mean, Listen, I, 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 so, so Palantir is a nonpartisan company. I don't yeah. even run it anymore. I, I'm, I'm, clo right. I'm close to a lot of people behind it. Uh, you know, I remember at the time, even like we, like even President Obama agreed. For example, there's mm -hmm. lots of fraud in Medicaid. We should probably go after it. He visited yeah. us. He agreed he was going to do it. His office ended up stopping us yeah. from doing it because every want, president they didn't want says, that. you know, they know thirty percent is. It's yeah. waste, fraud, or abuse, but, but you office, can never stop. Their office doesn't want us to yeah. because they don't want the narrative out there admitting right. how bad it is, which is frustrating because I think we can actually fix most of it. But, yeah. Oh well. Is there any way to change that political calculus? You need a really strong, really competent president who's willing to do it. I think mm -hmm. policy-wise, uh, the previous administration, the Trump administration was yeah. willing to, but there was a certain level of confidence that wasn't always there on the follow through and people would push back yeah. and they drop it. And he also is, you know, I mean, every president's like this, I'm not going to touch your Medicare. And that might mean I'm not going to touch your Medicare, even if you're getting it under the wrong circumstances. Well, it's not even for people. I think most of the fraud goes mm -hmm. to a lot of like very sketchy doctors and health systems. But yeah, but I think I think those places are very powerful special interests. And it just creates a huge headache to go after them. And you need you need a president who wants to focus on the issue. And listen, there's lots of things to focus on. I'm not, I'm not telling you this is the most important thing. It does bother me as yeah. an American that we waste 100 billion dollars or whatever it is a year yeah. on, on this nonsense. Yeah. Um, are you going to vote for Obama or for or Obama? I, mean, I sound like Donald Trump now, right? I'm, a, <laughs> I'm, I'm lost in the past. Uh, Trump or Biden? You know, I spend most of my time on the states because that's where I can make a yeah. huge difference. I have teams in 20 states yeah. for Cicero. Um, I, I respect people very much who would never vote for Trump. I respect people mm -hmm. who think Trump's policies are much better than Biden's. And so it's not something what, I, do, I tend to weigh do into. Do you respect people who definitely will vote for Biden? 
Um, if it's, I, I generally think there's a lot of failed policies, and I generally think that it's, it, it, you know, there are some people in this administration I admire, but yeah. overall, I, I do not admire this administration. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I I understand why some people morally still think yeah. that they like Bi prefer Biden to Trump. That's not my yeah. point of view right now. Do you? I mean, uh, now let's. Now I'm thinking maybe we should move to Singapore. Uh, is has is something fundamentally broken where we are looking at a, a rematch of Joe Biden and Donald Trump, and it is like you know Muhammad Ali and Joe Frazier if they were 20 years older, it seems, and and going at it again. I mean, they do seem probably slightly too old to be yeah. the people we should be electing. I understand why people are really angry at the way Donald Trump's been tweeted. I, you mm -hmm. probably saw like, Jeb Bush and I wrote a piece in, mm -hmm. the, yep. in, the, in the Wall Street Journal talking about how both Elon Musk and Donald Trump had the court weaponized against yeah. them. And, I, and I, I, I see people who agree with a lot of the policies Trump did and, and who are feeling he's mm -hmm. treated really badly. So I, so I know why that makes them want to fight for him. Yeah. And so, so listen, I, I understand, understand where we are and, and I don't think the country's broken or anything like that. Yeah. And, and I, I think there's, I respect different views on these things. Yeah. It is interesting though, that Trump has run twice and has never gotten more than, he's gotten less than 47% of the popular vote each time. And it's, you know, it seems like it's going to be very close now. So I, and this is just really to buttress your point that if you hang out in elite circles or highly educated circles, it's hard to find people who will say Trump is not the Antichrist. But in fact, <laughs> you know, 45 percent of the, the voters have said, you know what, I'd, I'd take this guy. Yeah, I definitely don't think he's the Antichrist. And, yeah. I, and I definitely think there are some things I really admire that he's done and some things that I dislike as well. Do you worry that, I mean, are we just going to, because it's going to be Trump or Biden, neither of these people, whatever, whatever else you can say about them, they plainly are the end of something. They're not the beginning of something new. Are we just going to be kind of in a holding pattern for at least four years? I don't. I don't. I don't know if that's actually entirely true. Yeah. I think. I think there is a lot of new stuff coming. Uh, on, especially yeah. on the right right now, we have a lot of new ideas that that we don't. You know, like I said, it was just just drone institute we're yeah. in, in over twenty states. There's a lot of people around uh, the policy orgs on the mm -hmm. right who would be running things well, in the next administration yeah, let's, positive. I, I hope you're right, um, you know, because the narrative, which may not be right, is that nobody wants to go into the Trump administration because it's going to be a train wreck. That also kind of, you know, the minute he gets elected, I think people will be like, oh, maybe I want to do that. I think that. people generally want to serve uh, the president of the United States of America, yeah. even if they don't necessarily personally always admire him. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the Cicero Institute. What's its mission statement? So uh, the Cicero Institute is uh, it's a nonpartisan policy think tank. We have a, a C3, which is education side, and the C4, which is we're working on the state level to, mm -hmm. to basically take accountability, align incentives, and really use the values behind why liberty and right. why our country works to fix problems we find. It's, it, I mean, it's named after Cicero. Uh, explain why. Uh, you know, Cicero was a Roman statesman. Uh, I really admire a lot of the wisdom we have that kind of reignited the Renaissance came from writings of his mm -hmm. that were saved. And he really stood for, in a lot of ways, for duty and for wisdom and for, mm -hmm. for how, how, you know, how a country is supposed to work and how a country is supposed to have its, uh, you know, its citizens who are merchants and who are natural aristocrats and getting involved and, and make things competent and logical. Um, let's talk about some of your policy uh, focus at Cicero. Um, homelessness is one. Um, how, what is, what is the Cicero Institute's approach to homelessness and how is it different and more effective than what you encountered in California? Yeah. So that's, you know, we're looking for areas where there, again, where there's giant gaps in the world between how things should work and how they work today. Mm -hmm. Uh, thanks to bad policy and, and the homelessness stuff is a really good example of that. Our, our, our general policy is that, is that, I mean, basically it's common sense. The way things are done now in California are mm -hmm. totally insane. You have uh, you have a billion dollars being given out, not based on data or metrics, but based on political favors to very powerful, very corrupt nonprofit groups whose incentives are completely misaligned. So these cities and these nonprofit groups get more money for doing the wrong things. Well, and, so what are what are the I, and I know you're a big critic, and I think this is capturing everybody in the field of of the housing first policy. That like the first thing you do to address homelessness is somehow either build more housing or give more housing to people. Um, the, the, why is that wrong? The, the, the 75% of these people uh, in these cities uh, are, are on drugs uh, who are homeless and 75% of them are mentally ill. It's overlapped. And if you give someone who's on drugs and mentally ill a house, uh, you know, I think in San Francisco they have more people who died in these homes than who moved on to, 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 to being self-sufficient. I mean, this is a, it's a total mess. And then, by the way, who gets the homes? 
uh, is a lot of the people who are working in the, in the nonprofit groups get the homes and people are close to them, of course. Uh, and we try to make it so we had to give the homes to the people who are the most vulnerable, which sounds good on paper. It's that idea around equity. Yeah. And there's a, there's a vulnerability index they created, uh, which is used by most homeless groups now in most cities. Most, most of the cities around the country are using it, the progressive groups. And the index says you get more points towards a home if you're on drugs. You get more points towards a home if you've committed a crime. It's more points if it's a violent crime. Uh, you get more points if you're not in a drug recovery program because you need it more. And you, you, go through, you get more points if your kids are truant, if they're taken away yeah. from you. So you go through this. And if you're on the very far left and you see everything is just being your victim or not, and things are just happening to you, they say, oh, these things happen to you. Should you get more points? Uh, if you understand the world like a, like a person who understands logic and reason, is you realize, wow, these are creating incentives, mm -hmm. right? And so we actually go into, we follow, our nonprofit will follow uh, and try to help people working with the homeless industrial complex. Even here in Austin, they walk mm -hmm. into this thing that's been set up by these progressive groups. And, 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 he, and, they, and he say, you, sir, deserve a home. Here's how you can get a tent. And he mm -hmm. said, I don't really need a tent. I'm sleeping on someone's couch. He says, I'm going to pretend I didn't hear that because mm -hmm. you're more likely to get a home if you're in the tent. And here's how you set it up. And, and, and then he comes mm -hmm. back two months later and he said, and she says, oh, you're not quite there for a home yet. The Republicans haven't given us enough funding. And he says, I hear I would have maybe qualified for a home by now if I was on drugs. And she mm -hmm. says, well, that might have given you enough points, but we don't yeah. like to think of it that way. Like, this is literally the conversation. Yeah, yeah. It is. It is. It is more, I think a lot of people don't realize our country is like more insane on these things than, yeah. than, than they, they assume it's like something more logical than it is. It's not. Do you, um, you've, you're, uh, the Cicero Institute has model legislation, right? For how to deal with homelessness. It, it does. We have, we have eight different points that, you know, gov, gov, governor, governor. What are the big ones? Yeah. Uh, well, the big ones is you want to redirect money away from housing first towards mental health treatment and, and mm -hmm. drug treatment. You want to redirect things towards temporary shelter, not towards, not, not toward, you know, not towards mm -hmm. just giving away homes. It's much more efficient and scalable. You want to realign the incentives. So cities ban street sleeping and yeah. put people into the shelters and they don't get more money for bringing more homeless people in. You want to basically, you want to basically realign things where the dollars given out to the nonprofit groups are given out based on metrics and goals. Right. So you have accountability, you audit mm -hmm. them, you say, here's your goals yeah. and you get the money, not based on being politically connected, but based on what you're hitting. Right. And, and, and like, by the way, the, one of the big ones we really like uh, is what is basically called diversion courts. And so you want a court that could actually force treatment for people. So yeah. if someone in San Francisco, uh, forgive me, has pooped on the street for like mm -hmm. a fifth time in a row, rather than say, oh, we can't do anything about it. Just go out mm -hmm. there and do it a sixth time, which is disgusting yeah. and bad for everyone. You say, I'm sorry, we're not going to put you in prison because we're not jerks, but we're going to put mm -hmm. you here in forced treatment. Which is kind of like the obvious solution. It's Which like, is also kind of like prison, right? I it mean, is. Better, it is. But, so, yeah. so technically, they do deserve to go to prison for having broken yeah. the law, but that's right. really mean. Let's, just, let's send them to somewhere else instead yeah. and force treatment. Because you, you can't just let people keep yeah. pooping on the street. It's like having an adult right. in the room. Yeah. It's, like, it's like these are children in charge. You How, can't just let a person keep doing that. Can I, you know, I, uh, I, I you know, we have many. Uh, uh, reason is a house with many mansions, so we have lots of different uh, differences of opinions. Of course, and I'm, you know, within within that, I'm, you know, I agree. I mean, I think if you're constantly defecating on the street, like you, there should be you're real breaking the law and you're hurting that. society. But how, um, in in general, with a lot of policies like this, how do you make sure that you are not just creating another power structure that can be used arbitrarily by the state or by whoever is in power? to punish people that for whatever reason you don't like. No, a hundred percent. And yeah. I think this is like where a lot of our government br is broken mm -hmm. today is you have to have separation of powers. You have to have checks and balances. You have to have a separate legislative, judicial, and executive. It's one of the key things we get wrong with our administrative state today. And so, you know, but, but you do need, a, you do need rules about mm -hmm. this you create, and you do need a court system that enforces those rules. You do need a way to appeal to another thing outside of that court system if it's doing mm -hmm. something wrong, you know? Um, so let's jump from homeless people and possibly forced diversion to something else that um, I've heard Cicero is involved in, which is actually pretty interesting, is creating kind of nonprofit prisons that would, you know, this is not a private prison and it's not a state-run prison, but it's something that would be incentivized uh, or it would get money based on getting uh, its inmates not to come back to prison, not to be recidivist. Yeah. Um, talk a little bit about that and how that kind of illuminates what Cicero is about. Yeah, so, so again, we're all about incentives and accountability mm -hmm. and really things that create effective functional cultures to get the best results. And right now our prisons in America do not have effective functional cultures. They, mm -hmm. are, they are mostly very negative cultures. They mostly have extremely poor results relative mm -hmm. to what's possible. And what's, what's amazing is when you wanna look for incompetence in the world, you look for volatility of results because actually it turns out there's some programs in some prisons for the same mm -hmm. sets of people that have like half or a third of the recidivism rates mm -hmm. and, and so and so how do we do that and i think i think like a 
a not very smart politician, but who wants to do the right thing, will try to look at that program and want to say, we're going to just pay money for that program and we're going to try to copy it. Mm -hmm. That's like level, that's like one level. But the higher level is how do we create a system mm -hmm. which is as close as possible to the way the market works, mm -hmm. where the things that are working get, get more funding right. and get rewarded and the things that are not working go away. Because the problem is, is one system might work somewhere, it's not going to work ever, yeah. everywhere else. I mean, the people aren't doing it right. right. Maybe it, there's lots of reasons why. And so, so you, you want to make things echo as close as possible to a market. And this, this actually gets down to one of the core misconceptions about prisons, Nick, mm -hmm. is a lot of people... Uh, you know, in general, like, oh, we have these for-profit prisons and that's what's ruining everything. Yeah, no, and, and 10% of the prisons. Yeah, exactly. It's 10% yeah. of the prisons. And, and it's not the fact that they're for-profit. By the way, these for-profit prisons are not very good in general, right. but it's not because they're for-profit. It's because their profit incentive is the wrong mm -hmm. incentive. Mm -hmm. Imagine if we gave uh, a bunch of like the best entrepreneurs the right incentive and say, listen, yeah. you can only make money in prisons by getting your recidivism rate down, by making mm -hmm. sure people who, when they come out, they come out employed. Mm -hmm. by, by making sure when they come out there, you know, there's ways of measuring like basically like their success yeah. in the community and they're not going to break these communities. Like, like that's what we should be doing. There's, there's 37 prisons in California. Imagine if we mm -hmm. measured all of this really well mm -hmm. and every, every couple of years replace the bottom three or four and gave rewards the top three or four, mm -hmm. right? Like make it, make it so they actually have, they're all part of this mission so where they like cared about. It's like relegate them. It's like English, British football, right? You yeah, exactly, that. exactly. So this is, so it's like, so, so, so how do you do this? Yeah. This is, cause so first of all, there's policy we're trying to pass. There's a bunch of great mm -hmm. policy. And unfortunately in Arizona recently, like the private prisons, which are not the good private prisons, they stepped in and, they, and, they, and they've killed some of it, but we're gonna get it next year, we're gonna keep fighting. Mm -hmm. uh, but, but there's other places where we have passed policy for incentives for probation and parole, it's worked extremely well. But here's another thing we wanna do, exactly, we wanna take a for-profit prison, we wanna buy it into a nonprofit. So imagine putting it in a okay. nonprofit, so now it's in a nonprofit, now we're gonna run it inside of that nonprofit as if the policy was already there, as if our only yeah. goal was the people coming out have higher employment, as if people, we don't want people to come mm -hmm. back, and I want to do that in order to show what's possible. Because again, it's back to that volatility concept. If you can show yeah. that something could be much better than it is, you kind of inspire people to say, wait a second, right. how do we get more of this? Because this is possible and no one's doing it. Do you think too many things are crimes? Yeah, you know, I, I'm, I'm not for locking up nonviolent drug yeah. offenders in general. I have people in my life who I've worked with who have spent a lot of time in jail for things like that that, mm -hmm. I, that I think they shouldn't have done. I think our regulatory state is, is way too mm -hmm. big and it's way too easy to get someone yeah. in trouble for a lot of nonsense. We have 9 million words of regulation per state right. on average. It's, it's, it's a mess. So yeah, I, I think there's definitely way too many crimes. That said, you do need to put the bad guys in jail. Sure. And, yeah. and if you don't, you get really high crime rates. And, and mm -hmm. there are people who are who, who, who need to be punished, need to be mm -hmm. deterred from doing what they're doing. So I'm, I'm not a, I think there's a whole thing on the left, which is like prison abolitionist, which is insane. Yeah. And I think that's gonna, it's like hurts our society. Mm -hmm. I think there's a thing on the right, which is probably too mean, where it's yeah. just like you lock up everyone and copy mm -hmm. Bukele, which is probably not what we should do in the US, <laughs> even though maybe it made sense in, you know, in yeah. Central America. But I think that both the left and the right, like we all can agree mm. that we should run these prisons competently. I was we don't hoping want, you were gonna say that the right and the left can agree they really should be libertarian. That it is, but, is it, but I think this yeah. is a libertarian yeah. concept from the sense that you're taking the things that work about liberty, yeah. work about a free yeah. society, and you're applying it to get competence in something yeah. that we all can win on, right? Um, another thing, and I don't know if this is filtered through the Cicero Institute or not, but you are a big supporter, one of the co-creators of the University of Austin. Yes. Um, what drew you to that project? I mean, you're a Stanford grad. Um, you have written, you don't want to send your kids to an Ivy League or I guess Stanford. Um, what 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 is the market gap that the University of Austin you're hoping that it, it will fill? Well, I, well, I hope in in fifteen or twenty years the Ivy League or Stanford might be might be better, right? right? I think I think I think if you haven't been in these universities the last ten years, you've really missed like the rapid rapid decline mm -hmm. of them on on a number of vectors. You basically had these kind of radical far left ideologues conquer these places. You had, there's more administrators than kids at Yale. There's almost as many at Harvard, and they're they're to the left of the of the professors. Mm -hmm. uh, the professors in a lot of these departments are basically really focused on these very very extreme ideologies, and you can't become a professor or even a PhD student anymore if you don't mm -hmm. go along with that stuff mm -hmm. for the, most of the time in these places. And uh, you know, it's 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 really a, a rot that's kind of core to what's going on in our civilization right now, which which is which is you know what Elon calls it the woke mind virus. Mm -hmm. that, you know, I think Dawkins came up with that with that concept. That it really is this mind virus that is spreading from there and and breaking a lot of things. I think I think a lot of stuff in our society when it doesn't have to. Uh, but it doesn't have to kind of fight for its living or it doesn't yeah. have to be accountable. It ends up just being taken over by this virus. And, and it's not like, you know, one of the arguments used to be that, uh, you know, kind of going left in college, you know, you could either be a, le a lug, a lesbian until graduation or a leftist until graduation, that 
it's now gotten to a point where it's broken the universities and the people coming out of them it's don't been, quite snap back or or they're stuck there yeah i mean there's a lot, there, a lot of them go into these like thousands of government funded nonprofits all yeah. over the country and just like spread ridiculous you know broken ideology a lot of them you know, it's, 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 you see, they've conquered a lot of the marketing departments of mm -hmm. a lot of corporations. They've conquered a lot of human resources departments mm -hmm. and they're, they're spreading ideas that are frankly like anti confidence ideas and mm -hmm. they're very broken. And so I think you, you see all these cities all around our country, blue cities. I mean, the vulnerability index we talked about for homelessness, like it makes no logical sense, but they've mm -hmm. learned in college, you don't argue against things like this. It's a virtue signaling thing. So mm -hmm. you have to go along with it. You have to nod, you have to like applaud, you have to snap whatever the hell they mm -hmm. do these days. And, and you're not allowed to say like, no, this is clearly wrong. It's bad incentives. Like, mm -hmm. and, and, and by the way, you, you learn that if you're, you're a white man, you shut up and you nod and go along. It's, it's, mm -hmm. The whole thing's ridiculous. So how does the University of Austin, um, you know, what what's the alternative then? Well, the alternative is not to have insane kind of like CRT Marxists running running okay. these schools. I mean, it's like just, just to have one yeah. of them run by like moderate sane people, right. right? So it's not like a conservative thing. It's not a libertarian thing. Like yeah. we probably still have more moderate Democrats than anything mm -hmm. else because it's academia, by the way. Right. That's generally been how academia works. Yeah. You have people on both sides, right? right. And, and you and you have a, a school that focuses on pursuit of truth. You have a school mm -hmm. that focuses on actually educating the kids and teaching them how to speak mm -hmm. up, teaching intellectual courage, right? Mm -hmm. Teach, teaching them how to have debates where you know the, basically the idea of like intellectual humility where you might not already have the answer. I think the whole idea of the woke mind virus is that you already have the answer and your job is to like shame and ignore people mm -hmm. who don't go along with, with your preconceived set of set yeah. of like solutions. Like instead let's actually go and let's learn and let's and let's violate mm -hmm. what we thought was true and, and learn from both sides, right? There's this thing it's just like a culture mm -hmm. of a healthy intellectual discourse, which is which is missing unfortunately right. on these campuses. And we've we've had these seminars where kids come from Stanford and Harvard mm -hmm. and Oxford and Yale and these places and they and they're blown away being being the seminar mm -hmm. for a week with like with great professors and debating ideas and mm -hmm. seeing debates, for example, on the whole trans issue, like being able to get like a like a famous trans economist and, and a, and a mm -hmm. famous feminist to debate the trans issue. Imagine right. that and to do so with intellectual humility yeah. and, and respect. And they actually ended up hugging each other afterwards, despite the kind of a fierce argument for a couple I hope hours. Nobody was charged with sexual harassment. <laughs> then, or? It's just it's just, it's, just, it's, it's amazing. Like people people have never even seen these yep. debates model in a healthy way to them their whole mm -hmm. lives like our society is not in a great place the way universities work um yeah let's talk a little bit uh, uh, getting it to a better place uh you have a, a very active Substack and um a podcast that is called american optimist that's right um what are yeah what what's the uh controlling idea there obviously it's american optimist you know that says something about it but you know who are you know who are the people that you're uh talking to there yeah well, I've been lucky to be able to found, I guess, a handful now of, of multi-billion dollar companies and yeah. I'm friends with a lot of people who have done the same mm -hmm. and, and I'm involved with a lot of that. I think the most and interesting. And yet, here you are talking to me. But, you know, it's like... <laughs> I, I, uh, I've been exposed to a lot of things that make me, I think, yeah. more optimistic because I understand yeah. like what a lot of smart people are doing to to change things in healthcare and to save lives yeah. with new breakthroughs there. And, 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 and there's just lots of cool stuff going on in right. our world. And I want to show people, here's what's going on. Here's what the confident mm -hmm. people are doing. Here's why we can be optimistic. Why? Yeah, uh, you know, and again, I, I mean, it might be temperament, but it's something more than that. Because many people in exactly your position are like, oh, my God, the world is totally fucked. And, you know, we got to batten down the hatches or there is no way we're coming out of this or, you know, everything is on fire. Um, why do you think, I mean, and it's, you know, why do you think the country really has been in a funk at least for 10 years or so? What, what do you think is driving that? Because materially, we're doing pretty well. And we, you know, we went through a, a really bad financial crisis, mostly, mostly caused by government policy. But we survived that. We went through, you know, a pandemic, uh, ex you know, a lot of dumb policies enacted, but we survived that. Like, why aren't we kind of feeling pretty good about ourselves? You know, I think there's, there, there, listen, so what are the challenges? There's definitely a civic breakdown. There's definitely this weird thing going on I think probably because of social media and because of living our lives more online where we're like these more disembodied people who don't have some of the same like traditional healthy ways of relating to each other relating to our communities uh, there's there definitely the algorithms make us far more polarized mm -hmm. um, there's there's a uh, I think it, I think I think Donald Trump's ascendancy was also tied to a lot of people on the working class and uh, you know facing competition from around the world mm -hmm. that overall lifted up everyone around the world, but that did make things tougher, I think, mm -hmm. uh, for, for quite a while for some of our working class to have to face that. And so, so, so you have a lot of different areas of struggle. Uh, I'm actually quite optimistic there's good solutions to each right. of these things, and, and I think it's our job to work on those solutions, but it doesn't mean these aren't real serious challenges for our society. Yeah. Um, you, um, 
you know, you also have a real, um, I don't want to call it noblesse oblige because I feel like that's slightly insulting, uh, both to the people <laughs> getting the oblige as well as the nobles. But It's a bad connotation these days. Yeah. Um, well, you know, what you, you seem to be different. I mean, you're, you're young and you're already doing this. This is the type of stuff that usually people in your situation, they wait like 10 or 20 years, cash out, and then start telling the world how to run itself. And that has a long and generally awful lineage. People like Henry Ford uh, did that to very strange ends. But, yeah. you know, what, what drives you to kind of be doing this now while you're still growing your business empire? Yeah, you know, there's a couple of things. One is there's just a lot around us that's really broken in our society. And I, I worry that, you know, if you, the history of these things, when you, when you take something that's really broken, if you don't fix it, that's when populists really come in and really pass mm -hmm. crazy things. So if you don't fix healthcare, then healthcare gets socialized. If you don't, right. if you don't, if you know, if you don't fix a bad, broken regulatory state, that's when they come in and, and they just completely mm -hmm. change all the rules and take it over and break everything. So, 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 so in general, I'm worried if we just don't do anything for 10 or 20 yeah. years, things could just be broken. Uh, that's one. And instead of being like, I could burn it down and then whatever rises after that'll be better, you're basically saying, no, it can just keep getting worse. Yeah. I mean, America is an exceptional country and it's very rare to get a constitution with a check on powers and it mm -hmm. enshrines liberty the way that ours did. And there's lots of things to fix now. Our regulatory state mm -hmm. has, has obviously grown in such a way that it's no longer really constrained by the same principles of the constitution. So we have to go and put that back in the box right. and fix it. So there's, there's big things to fix. But yeah, if we just start over from scratch, if you look at human history, like, you know, 900, 99 times out of a thousand, we get a really bad answer. Yeah. So, so I know we definitely don't want to burn it down. That's much worse. We have something really, really precious that we have to have to keep fighting for and improving. And, and you know, the, the other thing is, I, I do think actually that as an entrepreneur, from what I've seen, I think your mm -hmm. mind can work really well in your 30s, 40s, 50s, still in a way where you can still learn new things in a dynamic way. And I think you're going to have to slow down because I'm 60. I know so when, you, like when you start to get really lost, you lost me. Then. When you start to get into your later 60s and 70s and 80s, I think there's something that ossifies where it's a lot harder to like create new concepts yeah. for yourself yeah. that you can and, and create new expertise for yourself. I think mm -hmm. you, you can still be the best in the world at what you've been doing your whole life, mm -hmm. but to do something new. I wanted to make sure I was I was really yeah. learning these things in a time when I when I could be one of the best in the world at them. Do you worry that you know this is also true of kind of nations or or countries and societies where, you know, they go through a period of they get old and senescent. They there's lots of ways that yeah. they go and senescent, and that's why it's our job to come in and boldly fix them, right? Yeah. So so there's you know there's there's all these invisible hand of the market that gets rid of old companies, and we don't mm -hmm. have stupid companies built a hundred years ago around. If your restaurant, imagine if your like local town restaurant failed from sixty years ago and it was still there. I mean, yeah. But that's what the government right. is right now. So we basically have to go in and we have to put these same mechanisms yeah. in to getting rid of dumb regulations, getting rid of dumb parts of government, mm -hmm. and we haven't done that very well. Right. But but the reason I'm excited about what Sister Institute could do is mm -hmm. we can go into the states, we can do it in the states boldly. Mm -hmm. And then we could take those same frameworks and use them in DC. And that, that's what I'm trying to do. So I want to close by asking a little bit about kind of your intellectual genealogy or journey or whatnot. You had mentioned, I think, before we were on camera that uh, you you read Reason in the 90s when Definitely. you were in high school and things like that. Um, who, you know, and you used to call yourself a libertarian. You famously wrote a piece talking about why you are no longer, you no longer consider yourself libertarian or call yourself that. And I want to get to that. But who, you know, who, growing up, what were the what were the sources of the person you became, kind of intellectual, yeah. political? So, so I mean, obviously, when I was very young, Ayn Rand was an important influence, <laughs> and really the duty of the businessman to, to get involved and to fight for mm. these things. How um, did you stumble across her? My my father actually was uh -huh. read some of these books as well, so yeah. he, he and I don't always agree on on politics and everything, but he, but he but he was into that. And my younger brother was into Austrian economics, and so I hmm. got to read Ludwig von Mises and hmm. Murray Rothbard. If I'm honest, was a very strong influence on me when I was very young. I know, I, I'm not an anarcho capitalist, but I think there's yeah. just deep wisdom in a lot of mm -hmm. the structures and frameworks he came up with that were really fascinating. Yeah, and uh, you know, and when I was at Stanford, Milton Freeman was there mm -hmm. actually. He'd been in Chicago before that, and he right, was, was at that Hoover. Hoover. Yeah. And I, re I regularly got lunch with him. And his wife Rose often joined us. Oh, wow. He became a very strong did, uh, did he pay for it, or did you get a free lunch from Milton was, Freeman? I think that was, would be I think pretty. Awesome. I think Hoover did have free yeah. lunch. That okay, was yeah, yeah. it was pretty good. There are performative contradiction. There is a free lunch. Yeah. Maybe I was paying tuition though. So yeah, that's there right. Could have been something like that. Yeah. Uh, and so th those were really big influences on mm -hmm. me. Just you know, and I mean, if I'm if I'm honest, maybe like Isaac Asimov's Harry Seldon. I thought mm -hmm. I don't know if you ever if you ever read the Old Foundation series, yep. but Harry Seldon's job was to kind of figure out what was going to happen over the next thousand years mm -hmm. and to improve society. And I thought that was like a really great goal. I, I, I bore with a lot of 
talents. I'm, I'm lucky to, to yeah. be good at lots of this stuff. And so I like, hey, what's a really hard intellectual thing that's really important? Well, how can we have a positive impact on the future of our civilization? Yeah. And so that to me was, was very formative as well. Oh, that's interesting. I, I'm more of a Heinleinian if we think about it in those terms, because, mm. uh, but I mean, Asimov's more of an engineer, right? So yeah. it's like, um, but so then you stopped calling yourself a libertarian. Explain why. You know, I, I, yeah, I wrote, I wrote that piece that liberty is great, but libertarianism is dysfunctional. Mm -hmm. and, and, and my experience with libertarians, especially from the generation above mine, is it was mm -hmm. kind of like, it's like you sit on the couch and you yell at the TV and tell the yeah. government to stop doing things. And you maybe put some money to try to stop the government from doing things. And then the government ends up eventually doing it anyway, but and it ends up being even more dysfunctional and it keeps growing and you're kind of angry. And, yeah. and, 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 and that's, that's, that's not nearly as useful as getting involved and trying to put liberty-based frameworks into the government. So right. yes, do I think the government should be doing most of these things? No. If, yeah. if it, should the government be really small? I agree. Yeah. Should it, should it, am I a narco-capitalist? No, maybe not a narco-capitalist, mm -hmm. but I think government should be really small. Yeah. But there's all these insights that come from liberty and that come from mm -hmm. how our society works. Like we didn't, another one just to mention it, like vocational education in America. Do I think the government should have a bunch of vocational programs and training programs? Probably not. I'm, I'm pretty pro-liberty, but are they going to get rid of them all? No, they're not. Yeah. Okay, so given they're not getting rid of them all, how about we go and we say, how do we apply liberty to these things? You know how you mm -hmm. apply liberty to them? Other than deleting them. We're going to, read, we're yeah, yeah. We're going to go and we're going to say, listen, we're only going to fund you. There's 27 technical high end vocational programs in Texas. We only fund them now based on the salaries of the students coming out. Mm -hmm. That's a market signal that you can't game. So if you fund them based on graduation rates, they're just yeah. going to graduate people. They're going to cheat. Right. If you fund them based on the salaries coming out, guess what happened when we did that change? The salaries doubled over yeah. a period of six years. Doubled. Mm -hmm. It's completely changed the lives of 50 to 100,000 people. So, so you're taking these liberty and free society frameworks mm -hmm. and you're putting them into things and you're, and, you're, and, you're, and you're fixing and making government competent. And frankly, that's where the leverage points are these days. If you, if you, if you understand liberty, let's, let's fight and use those frameworks mm -hmm. to actually fix things. All right. I think we're going to leave it there. Thank you. Joe Lonsdale, thanks for talking to Reason. Thanks, Nick.